Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, brothers and sisters in our common humanity, thank you so much for coming this evening. Thank you so much for Hannah for a wonderful speech, wonderfully delivered speech. And um, so I, tonight I've been asked by the HERE campaign to talk to you about the principles that really animate the HERE campaign, which is humanity and equality in abortion reform. Um, this is a, a case that I'm going to make which is secular, uh, which is essentially humanistic or humane. It's not something which depends on religion, although there are many people I know who are religious, who are, who are here tonight maybe, or who are motivated by their faith, just as they were in the anti-slavery movement or the civil rights movement or the movement against child labour. But ultimately what I'm going to be arguing for is a case which anyone, regardless of their background or whatever their philosophy or religion, could accept, which is based on humane principles. So I'm going to summarize what I'm going to say. Um, all human beings are beings that are human. They possess the universal, substantial form, the, the property of humanity. In other words, you are a human being because you are a being that is human. And humanity is a rational and a personal nature that grants moral agency and rights and personhood. So therefore, all human beings, regardless of how little or big, regardless of how disabled or non-disabled, no matter what color or creed or sexuality, all are persons. All human beings have equal, full moral status by virtue of their common humanity. The unborn, as well, are children, the youngest forms of human beings, and therefore they, as human beings, are persons. They possess full moral status. They're equal to all the rest of us in dignity and rights, including the right to life. Unborn children possess full moral status, and therefore they're equal in dignity and rights. What follows from that principle is that abortion, that is to say direct abortion, what we call the deliberate killing of an innocent unborn human being, the carrying out of a medical procedure so that a child will not be born, is the violation of the right to life. Public policy should move, therefore, to restrict it. And do any of the arguments of the abortion lobby defeat these points? I, my answer to that will be no, and I will go and show you why. So, but let's first define our terms. I find defining your terms is quite important. I remember going to uh, Madrid in Spain uh, in 2011, and I like cider. I'm a big fan of cider. So I was going around, I was, I was going into bars and asking for cider, saying, Tiene Sidra, which means, have you any cider? And unfortunately, I wasn't pronouncing it like that. I was pronouncing it uh, Tiene Sidra, like the French did. Stavata Sidra had just come out. And unfortunately, it didn't sound like I was saying that. It sounded like I was saying Tiene Sidra, which of course means, do you have AIDS? Not what you want to say to a bartender when you're asking for a drink. I really don't recommend it. So words matter. Defining your terms really matters. So what do we mean by moral status? Well, we mean the extent to which a thing's interests moral matter for its own sake, such as it can be morally wronged or morally righted. And we discern the moral status of a thing according to what that thing is. Okay? This is a physical and a metaphysical question. Law presupposes morality. Morality presupposes the nature of things, what, what we call being. So an example of that. Can I kill it? If you ask that question, what presupp you're presupposing is, well, what is it? Is it a fly? or you prefer a poisonous snake if you want to feel something that is threatening to you, or is it my flatmate? Two very distinct uh, answers to those distinct questions depending on what it is. Can I use or exploit, uh, exploit or take it? Well, it depends on what is it is. If it's my uh, CD, yes, I can use it. If it's someone else's CD or if it's someone else's child, well, no. No, you can't do that. It all depends on the ownership of the object in question. So what something is, is very relevant to its moral status. And we ask what that is. We're asking about what is essential about it. What is its essence? Or if you prefer, what is its nature? So what is the unborn child? We're asking whether or not we can do something to the unborn child, in this case abortion. We have to say, well, what is the unborn child? What are we talking about? Well, the unborn, unborn as an adjective, is used, literally this is the Oxford English Dictionary definition, of a baby. A very young child, not yet born. It is of a baby. It is not of a group of cells. It is not of an object. It is of a subject. It is of a human being that we call a baby. And a child is a young human being below the age of puberty or below the age, legal age of majority. All of these things, the word child, the word baby, are being used of the baby in the womb. Not, again, dehumanizing language, but very much humanizing language. And a human being, of which the unborn child is the youngest example, is a man, woman, or child of the species Homo sapiens, like all the rest of us. A person, a member of the human race, a man, woman, or child. So an unborn child is a baby. We've got that down. 
when we refer to it as uh, refer to the unborn child as a fetus, as some people choose to do, and they think they're dehumanising by doing that. They think they're making it into an object rather than to a subject. Well, actually, what they're really doing is saying again, baby, because fetus is defined. It's a Latin term, means offspring, and it means an unborn human more than eight weeks after conception. That's really all the word fetus means. It is not somehow denying the humanity of the unborn child. It's just a technical term for where you're at as a human being. Similarly, the word embryo, it again just means young one. It comes from the Greek embryon. It's an unborn human, especially in the first eight weeks from conception, after implantation, before all the organs are developed. And that's true of blastule or morula or zygote, other uh, words used to describe very early human beings. So don't be misled by language may be employed by the abortion lobby or others. All these words simply describe an unborn human being. Indeed, Baroness Warnock, who, is, uh, who wrote the Warnock Committee Report, great supporter of legalised abortion, profound supporter in fact, even she would say only a fool would deny that human life begins at the point of conception. Now she's basically right in that sense, but she's also fundamentally wrong insofar as it's not human life that begins at conception. You could say conceivably a sperm is human life or an egg is human life or any number of other things are forms of human life. It's the life of a human being that begins at conception. And only a fool, or at least someone, to be more polite, embryologically illiterate, would deny this fact. But you don't have to believe me. You can believe not only dictionary definitions, but also embryologists themselves. The uh, definition of conception is the action of conceiving a child, or of one being conceived. William J. Larson, in his seminal book, em Human Embryology, says, we begin our description of the developing human which, uh, when the male and female sex cells or gametes, that is to say the sperm and the egg, unite at fertilization to initiate the development of a new individual. It is an individual that begins a conception, not a group, just a group of cells, any more than you or I are groups of cells. Signorelli et al. say fertilization is the process by which, again, the sperm and the egg unite to produce a genetically distinct individual. Um, more and Perso, in their developing human, the developing human, I, am, I emphasize, talks about the zygote, the new cell created by the sperm and the egg coming together as the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. Similarly, Orahali and Muller describe the zygote as the beginning of a new human being. I think I've belabored the point, but it's an important point to belabor. This is what we're talking about, a new human being. And even the supporters of legal abortion would agree with this. This is Peter Singer. Peter Singer is a, a radical supporter of legalised abortion, such that, indeed, as we will see later on, he believes that we should even be able to uh, commit infanticide, even after birth. Uh, babies, as far as he's concerned, do not possess full moral status or rights. But he would say, it is possible to give human being a precise meaning. We can use it as equivalent to a member of the species Homo sapiens. Whether a being is a member of a given species is something that can be determined scientifically by an examination of the nature of the chromosomes in the cells of living organisms. And in this sense, there is no doubt that from the first moments of its, or rather his or her, con existence, an embryo conceived from human sperm and eggs is a human being. Okay, so I think we've established the point. Whether it's a zygote, or a marula, or a brassula, or an embryo, or a fetus, or a newborn, an infant, toddler, prepubescent, pubescent, adolescent, or adult, we are talking about the same thing, a human being the same status, the same rights, everything similarly and equally applies to you at all these points in your life. Because what doesn't change, no matter how much you do, no matter how much you grow, the one thing that doesn't change is the qualitative fact that you are a human being. That is the thing that marks you out from you, con it's your conception onwards. You are the human being that is you. And so we're talking about whether a zygote or a blastula or an embryo, six weeks. Eight weeks when you become a fetus, that's to say you look like a human being at, at eight weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 16, 20. All of these points, by the way, are, are legally aborted uh, in the United Kingdom on, on any grounds, essentially, on abortion on demand. 20 to 24 weeks and onwards. Okay, so I've belaboured the point and I've established it. We're talking about a human being. Unborn children are human beings. But you might say, so what? What is so special about humanity? Why do we privilege human beings? What's so special about us? Well, human beings are beings that are human. We've said that. We have a human nature or essence. And this is what we call, in philosophically, people call a universal. This is a property or a quality that entities have in common. So Hannah and Lord Alton and Peter and Sue and anyone else, we're all unique, unrepeatable individuals 
But the quality of being human, which we all exemplify, is repeatable. It's commonly possessed over and above every individual human being. So why is this relevant? What, in this got to, what has this got to do with the moral status of the unborn child, or indeed anyone? Well, it's relevant because it illuminates what we mean when we talk about humanness or our humanity. Uh, humanity, like uh, circularity or redness, all of these are just um, particular forms, forms that we all possess. It's the form, the essence, the nature and structure or the organisational th pattern of the human being that makes us the kind of things, the kind of substances that we are. It's what's essential about us. So this answers the fundamental question relevant to moral status. When you ask, well, what is it? What is Hannah? What is Lord Alton? What is Peter? It's morally relevant because the nature of our being, as humans, like any other being, is what's what gives uh, rise to certain properties. And these are, as we will see, personal properties. So most animals have, for example, just to uh, illustrate the point, the property of seeing. That doesn't mean that all animals of a particular kind can see. Uh, certain human beings, although human beings can see, some human beings are blind, as are dogs or cats or others. But nonetheless, these are extrinsic causes that would cause that to happen. These are uh, what is inherent to our nature, what is inherent to human nature, is the inherent potentiality of sight. That's always going to be there, regardless of whether or not any individual human being can see. And it naturally proceeds from our nature as human beings. It's not merely its biology, but it is what its biology denotes. And human nature, the thing we all share in common, is a rational nature. And so we, all of us, are rational animals. We all have a nature that possesses the inherent potentialities of uh, reason and free will, the things that make us particularly special as a species. And this is a personal nature, because these inherent potentialities are personal. They enable us to have personal lives. We have relationships. We can do things in ways that no other animal can do. So intellectual thought, free actual choices, relationships, these properties belong to us and proceed from our nature and proceed from us by virtue of simply one thing, the virtue of the fact that we are human. And so all humans, every single individual that shares a human nature, by definition, are persons. They share a personal nature, even if they don't get to make personal actions. So if a child dies tragically due to typhoid, the fact that they never had the ability to have developed relationships did not make them any less of a person because it didn't mean that they had any of the less of a personal nature. They simply hadn't developed those inherent potentialities in their nature that would have allowed them to do those things. Personal features that are essential to us as human beings aren't fully developed, but they nonetheless exist as those inherent potentialities. And this is true regardless of what happens to us, regardless if um, I'm blinded, regardless if I'm rendered very mentally disabled by a horrible accident, uh, by a brain injury, by the uh, lack of oxygen going to my brain. Regardless of that, it doesn't change the fact that I have a nature which is human and that has those inherent potentialities within it. Okay, so I've established that. But what this has is the importance of giving us moral norms. The kind of things that we are, the human beings that we are, means that we have moral status, moral rights, and therefore legal rights. Our nature gives us faculties that have certain ends, certain purposes. And the fulfillment of those ends is what constitutes the good for us. So, for example, I have the faculty of eating. What's the purpose of my eating? It's there to nutrition me. Now, I can also enjoy my food, but ultimately, I break, essentially, a natural law if I eat poison. I break a natural law, in other words, a kind of moral principle, if I do something that is damaging to myself in that way, because that isn't good for me. What is good for me is to nutrition my body. Similarly, intellect. If I fill my head with lies, things that I know are not true, then I'm not fulfilling the purpose of my intellect. The purpose of my intellect is to know and think about true things. So fulfilling the purposes of our nature is what constitutes human flourishing. I flourish in my eating if I'm healthy. I flourish in my intellect if I think of things that are true. And this good becomes moral goodness because we can choose freely whether or not to pursue those things. You have the ability to choose whether or not you, you eat healthily. You have the ability to choose whether or not you use your intellect in a responsible manner. You have the, the ability to choose whether or not your will is something that wills good things or bad things. So this, all of these norms perform a, a, create a natural law, a natural law which gives us moral norms that tell us what is the good for us. And this is what we call the natural law. We also live in society with others. That's part of our nature. We are social animals. Human beings are, uh, this is a fact that is enabled by our rational nature because it's a personal nature, because it enables us to have relationships with others. And these are the same purposes throughout our natures that we all possess in common. You have the same uh, 
obligation to be healthy as I do. And so consequently, it doesn't just, the natural doesn't just enjoin us to observe these purposes within ourselves, to choose to be healthy, to choose to do good things for ourselves, but it also enjoins us to do those things for other people. And this is what grounds moral status. In other words, things that morally matter for its own sake. Having a rational nature makes us moral creatures and also gives us moral status, and I must therefore respect your flourishing. I can't just respect my own, I also have to respect yours as well. So this moral status has to be equal between all human beings, because it all proceeds from the nature that we share in common. Therefore, since the nature that gives us this moral status is equally shared by all of us, every human being without exception, again, regardless of how small or how large, regardless of how uh, disabled or non-disabled, whatever they are, no matter what our gender, no matter what our sexuality, everyone has full moral status. We can only all pursue our own flourishing if our fellow human beings don't interfere with that pursuit. So the existence of the natural law entails that we have certain rights against interference with that pursuit. If you have moral obligations that I must respect, then you have a right to me respecting those obligations. Therefore, for example, if you, the only way you can flourish is if you are alive, you have a right to life. You have the right to, that I shall not lethally interfere with you. And because that right proceeds from your nature, it's a natural right. Further, because it proceeds from your human nature, it's a human right. This is the basis for what we call human rights. And human rights are shared by everyone who is human. So since there is no greater interference than being killed, it follows that every human being has the right to life, amongst many other rights that we might talk about. In fact, this is the most basic right, because you can't flourish if you're dead. And this is a negative right. That means that it means that it enjoins upon me the uh, moral duty, and indeed the state's the legal duty, to not do something as opposed to a positive right, which would be to enjoin you to do something, uh, to, to actually do something itself. But it means that the right to life does not mean that you have the right to give, be given anything that you need in order to survive, like, for example, my kidney, but it does mean that you have the right not to be interfered with by me and that you, have the, you also have the right for the state to stop me from interfering with you if I wanted to. So this possession of full moral status and natural rights, as well as having a personal nature, completes our conception of personhood. Being, having a moral status, being a human being with a human nature, makes us persons. A person is, as Boethius called it, a nature rationalis individual substantia, an individual substance of a rational nature, therefore it makes us a person. A person being, defined again by the dictionary, a human being, regarded as an individual, also a man, woman or child, or as distinguished from an animal or a thing, and also... An individual, natural person, or corporate body recognized by the law as having certain rights and duties. So this moral truth, this moral status that we all have, is a legal truth. It, it, it makes upon the state, gives the state an obligation to respect and protect the rights that all of us have. So human beings are persons, they have a personal nature, they can be morally wronged or righted, they have natural rights, and the moral status or value that we have by virtue of being persons we generally refer to as dignity. And this whole position, I, I prefer to refer to, because I'm pretentious, as a dignitarian humanism. So, this is the fundamental basis of something which we all tend to respect, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which clearly establishes the right to life to, again, what? Pers persons as opposed to uh, human beings? No, actual human beings. Not human beings that can do certain things, not human beings who are particularly intelligent, not human beings who have the ability to reason themselves out of situations. No, human beings, regardless of what they can do. It says, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom and justice and peace in the world. Article 1 refers to all human beings being free and equal in dignity and rights. Article 2 says that everyone is entitled to these rights and freedoms without distinction of any kind. Article 7 says that all are equal before the law are entitled without any discrimination to the equal protection of the law. And then Article 3 says of the, begins the rights that, begin, that uh, are given throughout the entire uh, declaration as everyone has the right to life. The very first right referred to in the entire declaration. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which I think is relevant for the discussion we're having tonight, says that 
And by the way, the Isle of Man is a signatory to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of the Child, Convention on the Rights of the Child, as is the UK. It says, bearing in mind that as is indicated in the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, the child, by reason of his physical and mental immaturity, needs special safeguards and care, including legal protection, before as well as after birth. Before as well as after birth. And of course, Article 6 gives one of those protections as the right to life. Consequently, there exists, by the way, no right to abortion morally, no right to abortion legally. There is nothing in international law that gives any kind of right to an abortion. But as we've seen, there clearly is a right to life, which is applicable very much to the unborn child as every other human being. Uh, for confirmation on this, see the San Jose articles on, the un on abortion and the unborn child in international law. It was written and affirmed by human rights lawyers and advocates, scholars, elected officials, diplomats, and medical and international policy experts. So, we've said, we've got through the unborn child, we've established as a human being, that human beings, that by virtue of their nature, have natural rights, that natural rights are human rights, affirmed in international law. So we have the moral and the legal foundation for affirming the right to life of the unborn child. So how does this relate to abortion? Well, the British NHS defines abortion as the medical process of ending a pregnancy so it does not result in the birth of a baby. It is also sometimes known as a termination. So the point of an abortion is that a baby is not born. The baby exists, but we don't want the baby to be born. Therefore, we will do something to the baby that will prevent them from being born. That is what abortion is. That is the reality of abortion. The key aspect here is why pregnancy is ended and the means by which it is ended. So what, therefore, are we talking about when we refer to abortion? Well, there are four main methods in the UK that are used, so I will refer to them. Vacuum aspiration is a procedure that aims to remove the unborn child from the womb by using suction to break her body into pieces. The procedure uh, usually takes five or ten minutes and can be carried out under either local or general anaesthetic. Um, so in order to gain entrance to the uterus, the pregnant woman's cervix, which is essentially the muscle ring uh, that forms the entrance to her uterus, uh, must first be dilated uh, or widened to allow the surgical instruments to pass through it. Um, this is difficult because the cervix is deliberately hard. This is a protection mechanism for the unborn child, so you have to break that. Uh, it's naturally closed to protect the baby from miscarriage or from attack. So a tablet may be placed inside the mother's vagina or given orally a few hours before the abortion to soften the cervix and make it easier to open. But when the cervix is sufficiently dilated, the abortion surgeon then inserts a hollow plastic suction tube which is connected to a pump and has a knife-like edge on the tip into the uterus. When the suction begins, there is many times more powerful um, a suction than a household vacuum cleaner. It tears the body of the unborn child into pieces and at the same time sucks these remains into a bottle. The, the abortion surgeon must then uh, cut the deeply rooted placenta uh, from the inner wall of the uterus. Now, great caution has to be taken at this point to prevent the uterus from being punctured during this procedure. That could cause a hemorrhage and a state further surgery. In fact, if it's done uh, improperly, then the, the, the woman could die. She could bleed to death at this point. Um, infection can easily develop if any fetal or placental tissue is left behind in the uterus. So similarly, a complete evacuation, if, you would, if you'd like that word, of the uterus has to be affected. Um, this is when a long-handled curved blade known as a curette, which was the image in the first uh, part of this section, uh, is used to scrape the lining of the tomb uh, of the womb, removing any remaining parts of the baby and her accompanying tissue. So um, this is the first form of surgical abortion. The second is dilation and evacuation. This is after 15 weeks. Now, this is a major uh, abortion procedure carried out under general anaesthetic. It's carried out particularly in late-term abortions, uh, such as when a baby has a disability. Uh, that generally is detected rather later. Uh, certainly, if it's, pr if it's uh, detected and then confirmed, it's detected and confirmed rather later. And so, in 2015, 5% of all abortions in England and Wales involved d &E. Thankfully, it's not very often, uh, but it is nonetheless a reality. As with vacuum aspiration abortions, d &E first requires dilation of the cervix, but instead of a suction catheter, it uses forceps uh, with sharp metal jaws, just like that one. And these are used to grasp parts of the developing unborn child, and then they are twisted and torn away. A pliers-like instrument is used because the bones of the fetus at this point, the baby, are calcified, as is the skull. Um, so in other words, it's harder to remove the baby at this point. The doctor inserts the instrument up into the uterus, seizes a leg or other part of the baby's body, and with a twisting motion, tears it out. And this is repeated again and again. 
The spine has to be snapped, the, sp the skull crushed to remove them. The nurse's job is to re reassemble all the body parts to make sure that all are removed, and if they're not removed, uh, sharp edges of the bones can cause cervical laceration, and consequent bleeding could be profuse. And that's how it ends. After 18 weeks, in order to make dismembering the baby easier, d &E will probably will often be preceded by feticide, and we will come on to that. Now, a much more common uh, form of abortion, thankfully, I say thankfully, in the sense that it's not as gruesome, but nonetheless it is a still violation of the rights of the unborn child, is the use of drugs, uh, medical abortion. This can be early, this can be uh, late, um, but it's essentially the same procedure. It's the use of drugs to cause an early miscarriage. And 55% of all abortions in England and Wales were medical in 2015. This makes it the most common uh, procedure. But in the first visit, a pregnant woman is given an abortifacient, that is a drug that causes the miscarriage of the baby, called mifepristone. This blocks the hormone that makes the endometrium, that's to say the lining of the womb, suitable for the unborn child to be gestated, uh, that is to say given necessary nutrients by her mother. This causes the lining to break down, which breaks the baby's attachment to her mother. This essentially causes her to starve or suffocate to death. You're depriving the baby of oxygen, you're depriving the baby of the nutrients she needs to live. In the second visit, the woman is given a prostaglandin, which is an artificial uh, hormone that causes uterine contractions. And uh, within four to six hours of taking this drug, the broken down womb lining and the embryonic unborn child will pass out like a, a heavy period. Um, in some areas, this is administered on an outpatient basis, which means the woman can expel the womb lining and the remains of her child at home. Um, this is just the only difference between that process, which is an early form, and the later form is the length of time that it takes, essentially. But then we've got feticide. A feticide is what is performed in later abortions. Uh, this is something which you don't need after 24 weeks in the Isle of Man, but we do it uh, very frequently in the UK. Later abortions are caused by feticide because it means that the baby is not in danger <laughs> of being born alive, which is what they want to prevent happening. Feticide means the, the baby is killed prior to her body being delivered or removed from her mother's womb by the injection of a saline solution, potassium chloride, salt, um, into the child's heart, which causes her to have a fatal heart attack. This happens because potassium is a mineral that contains an electric charge. Um, and essentially what happens is that it disrupts the electrical uh, conduction of heart muscle, prevents the heart muscles from contracting, and this means the heart, baby's heart is forced to stop beating, which causes her death. Uh, interestingly enough, this is the same procedure that they use at the very end, or have used at the very end, of lethal injection in the United States for the death penalty. That's exactly the same procedure, um, except that in the death penalty, they first put you to sleep, and then uh, they cause your, um, your lung muscles to stop contracting as well. Um, in 2015, of the 1,284 abortions performed at 22 weeks and over, 44% were reported as preceded by a feticide, and a further 52% were performed by a method whereby the fetal heart was stopped as part of the procedure. Uh, only 4% of abortions at 22 weeks or beyond were confirmed as having no feticide whatsoever. And in fact, as uh, BPAS's medical director, Patricia Lure, reported in Abortion Review, at BPAS, we routinely perform intracardiac potassium chloride injections before d and &E at 22 plus weeks and greater. And in fact, um, this is a procedure which is recommended by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists in the UK. So, that's abortion, and it's clearly the destruction of an unborn human being. It is therefore very clearly the violation of the right to life of an unborn human being. So how do we justify this? How do people choose to justify this? Well... The alternative to the humanism that I advocated earlier on is a form of what I call subhumanism. This tries to separate out the human being from the human person. So say, oh, well, you're a human being in, a, in some kind of physical sense, but really, you know, uh, the person is, is just something, is something else. You know, you're only a person uh, if you have some kind of mental or physical capacity, like reason uh, or consciousness or the development of the heartbeat or the brainstem. They choose something. On what grounds, that's, that's another question, but they choose something and say, no, well, that's, that's what makes you a person. It's not being human. It's being able to do a particular thing, or it's having some kind of physical attribute. So it creates what's called a moral duality. On the one hand, you have the human being, that's one thing. On the other hand, you have the person, which is a human being that can do particular things. And it works the same way that I had earlier. Uh, it asks what makes us human in a moral sense. Um, but rather than asking, um, it will ask what, what's basic to a person, but rather than saying it's your humanity, it's your human nature, on the logic that I put out, 
it identifies what are called adiaphoristic, that is to say, completely irrelevant, secondary actualities. They ignore the essential substance of who and what makes a human being a human being, and they look at the contingent accidents of human action. In other words, the things you can happen to do, or happen to think, or happen to uh, be able to do as a biological process. You know, any human being who is severely mentally disabled cannot engage in rational thought in the same way that you or I can. But they're no less human. But they are, potentially, less of a person as far as this logic is concerned. Rather than saying that it's actually having these inherent potentialities and the rational nature that you possess, it's about actualizing those things, about being able to do stuff that makes you a person. But ideas have consequences, and we see the consequences played out in history. If the actualizing of inherent potentiality is what makes you a person, then who else can be excluded? Well, I can think of quite a few people. You're not just the unborn child. You can also think about the newborn. You can think about the infant. In other words, people who do not have the same mental capacities as you or I may do. You can think about the mentally disabled. You can think about people in comas. You can think about people in persistent vegetative states. There are plenty of examples of people that you can, you can think about who do not possess reason or consciousness. In fact, for, conscious, for consciousness, there's one simple example, sleeping pro-choices. Anyone who's sleeping does not have consciousness. And the same reason I don't believe in killing sleeping pro-choices, the same reason I don't believe in killing unborn children. But Peter Singer takes this logic, illustrates logic perfectly in his book Practical Ethics. He's a chap I mentioned earlier on. If the fetus does not have the same claim to life as a person, it appears that the newborn babies do not either. And the life of a newborn baby is of less value to it than the life of a pig or a dog or a chimpanzee is to the non-human animal. That is the logical consequence of morally dualistic, subhumanistic thinking. So you might say, oh, but, but hang on, um, the, the people who are sleeping or the people who are um, in vegetative states, the people who are comatose, well, they once were human persons, and therefore that, that just carries on, right? Well, no, there's no logical reason why that should be the case at all. There isn't a once and forever get out clause. If you're going to say that pre personal human beings, in other words, human beings that because they're in the womb cannot do the things that make you a person, then you have to forward the idea that there are post personal human beings. In other words, people who, because they can no longer do the things that made them personal, are any longer persons. This is precisely the creed of inequality and unjust discrimination that has justified subhumanist abuses in the past. You refer to accidental things like someone's colour or someone's sex, someone's ability to think, someone's lack of ability to think, someone's any number of other things, rather than the one thing that unites every single individual in this room and in this planet, our humanity. Now, I'm just going to go to finish off through a few abortion lobby canards that try to get round these problems. The, the, this is the last bit of philosophy that eventually they might try. Well, the unborn child is just a parasite. Um, just stop there for the moment. No, as a matter of biological facts, the unborn child is not a parasite. That is not the way parasitism works. If you're looking for an analogue for the relationship between a pregnant mother and the unborn child, it's actually symbiosis. The unborn child exists in a symbiotic relationship with her mother. But let's just forward that on. If the child is a human being, forget that. Let's say, okay, even if the child is a human being, still, as a parasite, or rather as a symbiont, they have no right to my bodily support. So therefore, I can, commit, I can perform abortion, I can go for an abortion. They don't have any right to leech off me, is in other words the, the way that they would explain it. And they would go by Judith Jarvis Thompson's famous violinist argument. What's that? Well, it's the argument that, okay, let's pretend that you are abducted by the followers of a famous violinist. He's a really important violinist. And they have, in order to make sure that the violinist will survive, they've connected you to his body in some way, such that you are essentially, for nine months, keeping the violinist alive. Now, if that's the case... Would it not be right, would it not be uh, entirely within your rights to disconnect yourself from the famous violinist? After all, you didn't choose to be there. Why should that person have any obligation on you? Why should you support this, uh, this action when it was essentially forced upon you? Well, there are very many problems with that argument, but not least because it's completely disanalogous to what abortion is. If you're going to say that just as you would have the right to disconnect yourself from the famous violinist and therefore as important as you might say the unborn child is, you have the right to disconnect yourself as a woman, f as a pregnant mother from your unborn child, well it's not a matter of simply cutting a connection, is it? The whole point of abortion as we've just seen is not that you're disconnecting yourself from the child, it's that you're forming it, you're, you're actually accomplishing the disconnection by getting rid of the child herself, by killing the child, by destroying her body. So in other words, um, a better analogy with abortion would be, I have the right, because the famous violinist is connected to me, 
to hack the violinists to death, perhaps by poisoning them first. Or maybe um, another example might be, for example, of medical abortion, where you're not doing something to the child's body apart from causing her to uh, be ejected from the woman's body. It would be like throwing a stowaway overboard. Now, you are not, strictly speaking, allowed to do that. If someone stows away on your boat, you've got a, a nine-month voyage to the other end of the planet. Not that that happens anymore. You might do. But if you, that really happened, then would you have the right to throw the stowaway aboard within the first three weeks of the journey? No, you wouldn't. You would have an obligation to keep the stowaway alive until such time as they could be handed over to the right legal authorities. That's the way it would work. That is, by the way, part of the right to life of the stowaway. That is the re reality. That is the analogy, if you want to have one, with abortion. Not the idea, oh, you can just rid yourself of the stowaway. You can rid yourself of the unborn child. No, that's not the way it works. So in the same way, the argument would be better Make sure the unborn child can survive, maybe up to 24 weeks, maybe after viability, and then give her over to someone who will care for her, if you don't want to care for her anymore. And so the, the logic of, uh, of the argument is illustrated really well here. There are some things we'd never accept. You wouldn't say, because you don't want to look after your baby, uh, you don't want to uh, anymore give her your, your uh, housing resources, your, your, uh, your monetary resources, your personal resources in terms of food. You wouldn't say, OK, well, it's my house, I'm chucking the baby out. You wouldn't say, it's my car, I can chuck the baby out. You wouldn't say, it's my boat. Well, why would you therefore say, it? well, it's my body? All of these things are your property. You own all of these things. But that doesn't justify you taking away the responsibility to look after that child until such time as the child can be looked after by someone else. That's the way the logic works. Now, some, uh, another abortion lobby canard, when we've exhausted philosophy, we have to go on to practical matters that will somehow uh, change someone's mind that way. So another uh, canard is, well, abortion is necessary for someone's health, and they'll use the example, for example, of Savita Halapanova in Ireland. This is something which was very much in the news a few years ago. Uh, this is a tragic case where a, a an Indian dentist called Savita Halapanova, um, she uh, died, and I will say why she died, uh, by an E. coli bacterial infection, but it was, the, the argument was made that, well, she needed an abortion. She asked for an abortion. She wasn't given an abortion because uh, Ireland doesn't allow abortion, and that's why she died. The problem with that argument is it's based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. It is true that she asked for her baby to be removed, partly because her baby was dying at that point and was going to die. She wanted to expedite the tragedy of the miscarriage that she was experiencing. But it wasn't necessary for her to survive that the abortion would take place. And to suggest that it is, is simply a lie. It's simply not true. So what actually happened, if you actually do uh, the work to actually look through the evidence, so look through the inquest, look at the health and safety executive report, look at the health information uh, QA report in 2013, this actually shows that Savita died from a progressively worsening sepsis, an infection that entered her bloodstream from a urinary tract and was antibiotic resistant. Now, had it been discovered earlier on, she could have been properly treated and she would have survived. And that's exactly what was found uh, by the inquest. It ruled that medical misadventure, failure to look at blood tests, to recognise, monitor and manage her infection and her sepsis took place. In no way, however, was the unavailability of abortion identified as the cause of her death. And it is a lie to suggest otherwise. Now, another person uh, referred to, uh, I'll refer to uh, very quickly after I um, reference this, if you don't believe me about Sarita Halapanava, uh, was Dr. Hima uh, Devaka, uh, who she's the president of the Federation of Obstetric, Obstetric and Gynecological Societies of Dr. Halapanavar's native India. This is what she said regarding her assessment of the situation. Delay or refusal to terminate the pregnancy does not in itself seem to be the cause of death. Even if the law permitted it, it is not as if her life would have been saved because of termination. And you can read just what she said online. So, bottom line, it had nothing to do with the availability of abortion. Period. Full stop. End of story. Uh, the Beatrice case was, uh, and it doesn't stand up as an example either, um, the tragedy of, of, of Beatrice is that she had um, lupus. Uh, she's, she was a, a, a case in El Salvador. This is a, a lady whose name is Beatrice um, officially, but that's to protect her identity. Um, essentially, she had lupus, um, and this was causing her severe problems. She was also pregnant, and she had an anencephalic child, in other words, a child whose skull had not completely developed, who would not survive outside the womb. And it was argued by the abortion lobby, well, she should be given an abortion. This is despite the fact that it was absolutely not necessary at all to give her an abortion to help her, help her health or to help her life in any way. And what happened was eventually in El Salvador, which is total protection of the unborn child, uh, the child was developed, uh, delivered early after the point of viability, viability, normal viability, which is after 24 weeks. The child died, but of course the unborn child was going to die anyway, but abortion was not used. In other words, the child wasn't killed, the child was simply allowed to die naturally. So again, 
No basis for abortion there at all. Um, but if you, don't, if you want to talk about the broader issue of health, I would simply refer to the Dublin Declaration of Maternal Health Care, which you can look at. And this says, and this is a group of gynaecologists and obstetricians who will say this, as experienced practitioners and researchers in obstetrics and gynaecology, we affirm that direct abortion, the purposeful destruction of the unborn child, is not medically necessary to save the life of a woman. So the basis for a huge part of the British Act and the, even the Manx Act is completely groundless. We uphold that there is a fundamental difference between abortion and necessary medical treatments that are carried out to save the life of the mother, even if such treatment results in the loss of life of her unborn child. An example would be uh, giving a cancer care to a woman, um, the double effect of which will cause a harm to her unborn child. The, the aim there is not to kill the unborn child. You're not directly aiming for the unborn child. What you're doing is you're giving, for example, chemotherapy to a mother, and as a side effect of that, the child will suffer. That's not the same thing if it's chosen as a direct abortion. And they say, then, we confirm that the prohibition of abortion does not affect in any way the availability of optimal care to pregnant women. So that argument by the abortion lobby does not work. They also say, well, legal abortion is necessary to stop deadly illegal abortions. This is possibly the oldest argument of the abortion lobby, and it simply, again, isn't true. It's not even vaguely true. In fact, uh, studies have confirmed that prohibiting abortion does not lead to an increase in maternal mortality. So in other words, you don't have high maternal mortality rates, that is to say deaths that are associated with childbirth or being a mother, being uh, pregnant, uh, which is a statistical means by which deaths from illegal abortions are measured the world over. A 2012 study undertaken on behalf of the Chilean Maternal Mortality Research Initiative um, analysed 50 years' worth of maternal mortality data. By the way, Chile is one of the places in South America that has one of the best pro-life, best rights life protection laws uh, in that region. It found that since Chile enacted a law protecting the rights life of unborn children in 18, 1989, the maternal mortality rate had dropped by 70%. Well, that's not what we'd expect if, indeed, illegal abortion causes so many maternal deaths. This was a continuance of a decline in the overall maternity and mortality ratio in Chile. It, so, in other words, making abortion illegal did not affect that whatsoever, but it found that maternal education, quality of health care, those are the things that affected a decline in maternal mortality. It was not abortion availability. Similarly, according to the latest WHO statistics on maternal mortality, which you can refer to online yourselves, countries with strong rights to life protections for unborn children, such as Nicaragua, El Salvador, which we've mentioned, Poland, Chile, which we, again we've mentioned, and next door to us in, Poland, in Ireland, have all seen falls in their maternal mortality rate since 1995 and compare favourably to their neighbours in the same region. So, meanwhile, countries with little to no protections compare less favourably with regards to maternal mortality than their neighbours with better protections. Here's a good example. And by the way, when you do ex uh, these examples, you need to compare like with like. You need to compare people in the same region, similar socioeconomic model, similar culture. That's the way to get a very good comparison, not different countries that are completely unalike. The relatively lower maternal mortality rate of 30 per 100,000 in Sri Lanka. This is one of the most pro-life, if you like, rights life protecting uh, countries on the planet. It's profound restrictions on abortion. Its maternal mortality rate is 30 per 100,000. Compare that with a 258 deaths per 100,000 births in Nepal, which is one of the most de facto permissive abortion systems in the world. The same is true within states as well as between them. An American study published in the Journal of Public Health Policy uh, conducted uh, in 23 states by researchers from Stanford showed that less permissive legislation was associated to lower rates of complications due to abortion. That is not what we should see if the abortion lobby's argument is correct. Another study published in the British Medical Journal earlier this year um, compared the maternal mortality of 18 Me Mexican states with less permissive abortion legislation and 14 states which had a more permissive law. So these are different states in the same country, some with more permissive, some with more restrictive. And those with the more restrictive law typically had lower maternal mortalities than those that had fewer protections for unborn children. I think we've, uh, we've made the point, but I'll just uh, make one more. The converse of all this is that making abortion legal does not necessarily reduce maternal mortality. And this is admitted by the World Health organization in 2014 when it admitted that illegal abortion is not synonymous with unsafe abortion, conceding that its historical measure of safe abortion, which was simply legality, simply was not sound. If you're affording that argument as an abortion lobbyist, I'm afraid the WHO has left you behind. What actually does make a difference, as all these studies demonstrate, is the quality of general maternal health care and emergency obstetric care. Basic qualities as well, like female education and literacy, clean water, sanitation, lower levels of domestic violence. These are the humane answers to the problem of unplanned pregnancy, not abortion. One final point before I have to end. 
the idea that restricting abortion doesn't reduce abortion rates anyway, so there's no point. This is uh, what I call the Monbiot meme, because it's uh, uh, essentially forwarded by this chap, George Monbiot in The Guardian. Uh, it's based on a study in The Lancet earlier this year, which was purported to show that criminalising abortion doesn't make it any less frequent. And it did that by comparing the abortion rates of different countries across the world. But the problem with that study is that it did exactly what I said earlier was a silly idea. In other words, it compared generalised, based on estimates, and it failed to control for the fact that countries are different. So in other words, compared very Western modernised nations with modern healthcare practices to some of the poorest and least developed countries in the world. And then it said, well, because these have higher maternal mortality rates here, therefore, and yet have uh, more uh, right to life protections, therefore this shows that right to life protections have no effect. Well, hang on, you're not controlling for the fact that they are poorer, have less developed healthcare. That's a fallacy. That is silly. But if we look at other studies which actually compare like with like, we find the opposite. In the US, a 2014 study published in the State Politics and uh, Policy Quarterly showed that right to life protections at the state level have practically succeeded. It was a meta-analysis that it looked at, that is to say it looked at a series of studies altogether uh, in a comprehensive way based on data from the pro-abortion Guttmacher Institute and the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from nearly every single US state for every year from 1985 to 2005. And it found that public funding restrictions so in other words, taking away the public funding of abortion. Parental involvement laws, when parents are involved, uh, informed about the fact that their children want to have an abortion and their permission is required. Informed consent laws, which mandate women to be informed in various ways about abortion prior to going through this procedure. All of these, and any law that limited abortion by any other means, all reduced the incidence of abortion. So abortion, humane abortion reform does in fact have an effect, and a positive one indeed. Um, a study for the US National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, I am coming towards the end if this is too technical, uh, found that in 1971 and 1972, after the state of New York legalised abortion in 1970, abortion rates were significantly higher, not only in that state, but in other states. In other words, liberalising or, or permissivising legislation actually makes the situation worse. Another study for Dartmouth analysed changes in abortion policy in Eastern Europe after the fall of communism and found that abortion uh, restrictions reduced abortion rates by around 25%. A quarter of those children saved. Proof of the pudding is simply the Isle of Man. If we take the 10 abortions that took place in the Isle of Man last year, add the 105 abortions that took place in the UK on women from the Isle of Man, that gives the Isle of Man an abortion rate of 6.67 per 1,000 women. The UK rate is 17.5 per 1,000. So the more permissive legislation in the UK leads to higher abortion rates. The more restrictive in the Isle of Man leads to lower abortion rates. So we have twice the Manx figure. The only rates, so the rates are associated with a stronger one here and a weaker one across. So now I'm going to finish off, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just to summarise again the points that I made earlier. All human beings are beings that are, hu that are human. We all possess the same property, which is our common humanity. Humanity is a rational and personal nature that grants us not just agency, but also rights and moral status, personhood. And therefore, all human beings are persons. All human beings have equal moral status. The unborn are children, the youngest human beings, therefore they have the same rights as all the rest of us and the same dignity. Unborn children possess full moral status and what comes from that is that abortion, which is the deliberate killing of an innocent unborn human being, is therefore the violation of the right to life. Public policy should move to restrict it and none of the arguments of the abortion lobby defeat those points at all. The answer is true humanity and equality being introduced into abortion reform. And that is precisely what the HERE campaign intends to introduce. And I will therefore allow the HERE campaign to set out exactly what they mean by that. But thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to me. I hope this has been instructive and has been helpful and informative. But these, I hope, are the arguments that really inform the way that we should approach abortion reform, bring true humanity and equality into the way that we think about these fundamental and important issues. Thank you.